Namaste, I'm Tendi Sherpa and uh, I'm a co-founder of Himali and I'm a mountain guide uh, from Nepal. And uh, I'm here today uh, at the uh, headquarters of Himali uh, for the first ever podcast of Himali. So this is going to be the inaugural uh, podcast uh, program uh, of Himali. And, uh, and I'm so honored to be here with uh, Alan Arnett. Uh, thank you, Alan. Namaste, Tindy. <laughs> Namaste. It is such an honor to be the first guest. And I guess we're going to talk together today about Himali and mountaineering and and everything mountaineering. Uh, you know, I often cover on my blog, so a little bit about me. I, um, I started climbing when I was 38 years old, believe wow. it or not. And I was an old man when I first started climbing. And I've been on 38 major expeditions, including uh, the Seven Summits and summiting Mount Everest on my fourth time. I'm a, I'm a slow learner. And I summited K2 at age 58. I became the oldest American to summit K2. Wow. And believe it or not, I still hold that record now nine years later. Wow. But I uh, have had this blog I've run since uh, 1999 where I cover all things mountaineering at alanarnett.com. And uh, it's, a, it's a passion of love because uh, I absolutely love mountaineering. I love covering you guys when I can't be in the mountains. I love talking about it and living it and living vicariously through what you do. So uh, wow. I wish you all the safety as you go through all of your climbing adventures going forward. And it is such an honor to be here with you, my friend. So, Tidney, let's talk about you, get to know you a little bit better. So you're born in Nepal, obviously. What village? So, Alan, uh, yes, uh, I'm from Nepal, and uh, I came from the uh, eastern part of Nepal. The name of uh, my town is called uh, Kembalung. Kembalung. It is known as a hidden valley and very, very sacred valley uh, for the Buddhism. And um, so actually, my ancestors were from uh, uh, Everest region as well, but my grandfather was a great monk. He oh. used to uh, practice as a monk uh, throughout, uh, throughout his life. And uh, so, uh, you know, as he was monk, he was always looking for uh, a special place to go and do a meditation. And uh, as he was searching for a, a, a sacred place to uh, practice his meditation, he was uh, told by a, a higher gurus that there is a place called Kambalong. Ah. And Kambalong, uh, uh, he did some research on that and he found it very, very sacred and very holy, uh, holy place. And that's why he, he moved first by himself. He went uh, to Kambalong uh, where there was like a very few people and very few, um, you know, uh, 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 yeah, really uh, not many people over there. And uh, so Kambalong, when he arrived there, he found it so special. And he, he immediately decided that this is the place where I want to be. And this is the place where I, where I want my uh, kids and my grandkids to be. So that's why uh, later on, like after he um, been there, he practiced a few months of meditation. He came back to uh, his hometown in Kumbu region, uh, like an Everest region. Then he decided to move whole his family and my father was there. And uh, so uh, he, he had all his children. He had actually a big family uh, mm. at that time. So he moved like all his family crossing uh, a big mountains of like almost uh, 4,000 meters uh, uh, with all the animals like cows and sheep and goats and, and, and maybe even chickens and maybe a and, yak uh, or two yaks and like <laughs> a little like tiny little kid he used to have a, a, a the young kid was still very young so um, his wife which is uh, who is my grandmother she had to carry uh, the little baby on her uh, shoulder and uh, and walk like almost uh, uh, 10 days uh, from uh, from his previous town to uh, Kembalong and once they got in Kembalong they first started um, uh, to build a small center for meditations uh, which was made of bamboo so no, bamboo uh, bamboo because we have so much bamboo around there yeah. and he built that little a uh, shelter of bamboo what they use as a as a monastery to practice like their meditations so whole his family and kids used to join him for the meditation it was not just him who moved there but also his siblings like uh, his brother younger brother and uh, and younger sisters and uh, and few other relatives uh, who moved all together so that was like a very uh, if we had made a, a movie that would be i think very successful and very popular because uh, back in that time you know uh, migrating from one place to another place uh, uh, was a, was a very difficult and uh, but he led that because uh, uh, because of the importance of uh, Kembalung, uh, the sacred valley, 
And after a couple of years, uh, my father, uh, of course, got married uh, with a local girl from uh, Kembalong, and she's my mother today. And <laughs> I got this uh, huge opportunity and a huge um, uh, blessings to be born in this special valley as well. So if there was a movie, I assume Brad Pitt would play you? Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think if, if, if I insisted. Yeah, if you insisted. <laughs> Or maybe Tom Cruise, I don't know. Yes. <laughs> so did you? Um, did, did any of your um, your father, your grandfather, did, did they climb at all? Were they into mountaineering? Or Yes, so absolutely. Like my grandfather, <clears throat> his whole profession was uh, a, a Buddhist monk. So he used to be always uh, gone. You know, he, he wasn't at home a lot. He was always gone on the mountain, and he used to do a meditations, or we call also retreat. And when he, he does that, he does that for like five months or even, okay. uh, even a year. So he comes home very rarely, and then but he had a, still he had a, a big number of children, and uh, and uh, uh, since there was like a lot of kids, the elder kids were already like uh, big enough to help uh, uh, right. help their mother uh, at home. So they used to carve uh, foods and uh, like uh, potatoes and barley and and buckwheat uh, in the village. And then, um, uh, but uh, yeah, my grandfather used to go to the mountain, but just for a meditation. Meditation, not, not, for not climbing, guiding or being... Not for guiding. So Did he do pujas uh, for yeah, expeditions? Yeah, uh, he never did a puja for expedition because uh, he wasn't really right uh, from the uh, Everest Trail. I see. So he was a little bit far away from there. Right. And then so later when uh, he moved to Kembalung, uh, actually my father uh, started uh, guiding. Okay. Well, he initially he started as a porter, uh, so he went on a trekking uh, in a many different areas in Nepal. Worked as a porter really, really hard, and then he said uh, he used to tell me the story about uh, you know when he started working as a porter. The, he says like it used to take like a month and month and half, and sometimes he used to as, uh, carry the lot for a, a expedition group that goes to like uh, Everest Base Camp. They start Everest expedition like from Ziri. Oh, so from Jerry, yeah, from Jiri, not from Lukla, not from Lukla. Like that's one, like another three or four days. Uh, yeah, walking. at least uh, at least uh, five days yeah, walk uh, yeah. from Jiri to get to Lukla, and uh, so uh, he used to explain me all that stories. And sometimes he used to carry a lot from like uh, uh, there's an airport in the Makalu region called Tumlingtar Airport. So from Tumlingtar Airport, he pick up the loads and he drops the load to Makalu Base Camp. And uh, usually he's gone there for like a month and month and half of long trek. And uh, so Makalu, Mount Makalu is one of the closest, uh, mm -hmm. closest mountain we have uh, from our region. And so when my father got a job as a porter, he carried load to the Makalu camp. Yeah. And on his way down, uh, uh, way back to Kathmandu, he actually came back to our village and, uh, and he spent some time with us. <laughs> so did you start off as a porter also, or did you yes, immediately yes. go into guiding? Yes, Alan. So actually, you know, uh, as, as I told you that my grandfather was a monk, his dream was actually to make all his family become a monk. Ah. That was his kind of like his dream. And that's why my father became a monk also, and my uncles became a monk. My, uh, my father's three sisters became completely nuns, so they never got married. And uh, so uh, we still uh, have, a, uh, you know, I still have two uh, auntie, a uh, sister of my father, who is the great nuns uh, in the monastery in my village. And uh, uh, my father is still practiced as a monk. Uh, so I also became a monk. You actually, became a monk. Uh, when I was a kid. Okay. Well, uh, the story is little Did long. you have a choice? <laughs> uh, I, yes, I actually didn't have a lot of choice in the yeah, village. Yeah. So what happened is like um, when I was age five, my parents decided to send me to the school. Age five. At the age five. And, wow. uh, but the school was very uh, far away. I had to walk uh, two days from my uh, home to get to the nearest school. And the two days walk was pretty long. Yeah. And it, it was pretty far away. And uh, so when I got at school, I used to stay at one, uh, one of my relatives' uh, you know, house. So it was, you know, they were so kind enough to uh, host me in their home. Uh, and then so I have to, I, I used to just stay at their home and not pay for lodging and fooding. Yeah, yeah. So in exchange, I used to work for them. So like that's, that means to say that I started actually working <laughs> since my age five. 
and then uh, I used to go to school. The school was still about uh, about one and a half hours walk from from that house, and so every day one and a uh, half hours walk to the school and come back uh, another one and a half hours. So I used to spend like three hours walking, uh, you know, uh, uh, for the school at three thousand meters or whatever. Uh, that was actually pretty low elevation. That was about uh, one thousand eight hundred meters okay. of elevation, and where I was born, my village is at two thousand and five hundred meters. Okay. So school life was a uh, was a pretty tough. And then after two years of school, uh, I, uh, I escaped from school because I found it too difficult. And after that, I joined a monastery because uh-huh. I didn't have any other choice. <laughs> we, were, we were in the yeah, village. Your grandfather said, you're going to be a monk, you're gonna go be to a the monastery, monk. Exactly. Tindy, go. <laughs> and if, and if, because if I say that I want to become a monk, whole family gets super excited and super happy and proud. So... Um, so yeah, I became a monk until my age of uh, uh, 13 years old. Okay. And uh, at the age of 13 years old, I left my, my village. So I left my village for Kathmandu. Back in that time, I had, since we don't have a nearest road, we had to walk like almost uh, 12 days to get to catch the, f- the, f- uh, the first bus to, to go to Kathmandu. There was an airplane, like a small domestic plane flying, uh, you know, after walking like a week. But then, you know, it used to be quite expensive right. to fly to Kathmandu. Yeah. So I still uh, continue walking like another week to catch the bus. And the bus ride was for two days and I got in Kathmandu. And when I got in Kathmandu for, for the first time in my life, it was a big shock because I have never seen such a big city. The big city, yeah. Such a big houses and buildings and such a huge the, number of people. The traffic. And traffic, the cars, everything. And plus, I felt pretty strange at uh, that time because I was the only one not wearing shoes and sandals. What were you wearing? I was wearing nothing. Oh, just, just bare feet. <laughs> just bare feet. <laughs> and I never expected that that, you know, sandal and shoes used to exist. (laughs) (laughs) So I got in there and I was like, wow. A little culture shock. (laughs) Everybody has something on their feet and I'm the only one who has nothing. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, then I uh, I started to look for a job because one of the main reasons that I came from my village to Kathmandu was to really look for a, a job as a porter. And the porter job was only thing that I can that I can expect and that I, uh, I could probably do because um, uh, since I used to work hard since my age five, you know, uh, as you know that in the remote, as we are from the very remote villages, you know, we, we live with a very limited uh, uh, resources. We, uh, very you limited grow things. all your own food we and grow grazier. all foods yep. and, and, and uh, everything. So we don't have any fancy things and we don't have any fancy uh, or standard life there. But whatever life we had there was a beautiful life if I recall today. Uh, it was so simple, so quiet, and uh, uh, yeah, it was super traditional, and uh, I, I can't just forget that moment. So you, became a, so you became a porter, and then eventually that led into becoming a mountain guide. Exactly. And I believe that you and Dave Schaefer, who founded Hamali, you met on Aconcagua down in South America. Exactly. Yes. Uh, so, like, um, uh, tell us about meeting Dave for the first time. Yes. Yeah, so, because that's really where this company began. <laughs> that was when the vision began, right? Yes. Yeah, so, like, uh, uh, I I got an opportunity to work on Aconcagua as a mountain guide, and I worked there for five seasons, and I submitted oh, okay. uh, I submitted uh, this mountain for uh, seven times. And I used to work for a local company called Grahales. Fernando Very well known. Yes. One of the most well known. And, right. uh, and I have such a best friends. Uh, well respected. Uh, yes. Well respected there. And uh, uh, so during the climb, uh, I met Dave at base camp. We were actually waiting for a storm to, uh, to go, go And I away. believe Dave was climbing by himself, right? Exactly. He was solo and, yes. and you were guiding, okay. Yeah, so like I, I, I met him there and uh, he said he was there climbing by himself. Yep. And I, I was kind of uh, really impressed, you know, to see uh, yeah. someone uh, trying uh, a Concagua a solo because this tall, skinny guy, exactly, <laughs> <laughs> like very tall and ha- carrying a big pack. Yeah, yeah. I was like, wow. So uh, he was, you know, we just share our plans when when I'm gonna be going up and what is his plan. But then we were actually waiting for a, a bad weather to pass. Okay, uh, before we we can go up. So during the bad, bad weather, uh, during we were waiting at the base camp, we got an opportunity to talk more and, and be more close friends and more and more close friends. And we kept our friendship 
and uh, and so back in that time the facebook was uh, not popular as today but there yeah. was a po- facebook so we started uh, adding as a friend and then we started chatting on a messenger uh, you know several times right. a month and then uh, so after uh, we finished the season uh, of course dev went early uh, 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 dev went back early to usa after he submitted akonga goa and i still had to work few more uh, uh, time few more days or weeks mm-hmm. to to finish the season on Akonga Goa and when I got back in Kathmandu I had more time to chat more about uh, their future plans so Dev had um yeah Dev was like hey Tandy I have an idea maybe we could work together and I was like uh, okay let me know what is your uh, idea and he said yeah I'm planning to op- uh, start a clothing business and Which, if you stop and you think about it, opening up a this was in um, 2000, 2014. 2014. I mean, by that time, the market is flooded with brands like the North Face and Mountain exactly. Hardware, Arcteryx, and just I mean, it's like why would you start up another company to make clothing for mountaineers? It's exactly. a small market, <laughs> so you must yes. have said, Dave, are you sure? Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> because uh, uh, you know, Alan. Uh, I had a long time dream to actually uh, uh, work for a clothing brand. Really? I really had that dream and but my dream was different. I didn't I didn't uh, think about opening our own brand. Okay. Rather I was uh, planning to maybe uh, represent uh, uh, for some some brand from USA or Europe. Become you know, an ambassador and for them. Become an ambassador or, yeah. or even open up a shop in Kathmandu oh, I see. Okay. And, and sell their product. Right. Like we have, you know, many other products are, are up in Kathmandu. Right. And I just want to do, uh, uh, sell some product that, that is not in Nepal yet. Okay. But then when Dave came up with that, that idea, I was like, wow. Hey, why not? Yes. I, I, I had exactly the same dream, but just a little bit different. But yeah, I'm also into clothing. <laughs> I love mountain gear. I love uh, the the different brands and everything. And I have wear like I I bought uh, so much like different brand to try and sure. taste. I always I always wanted to try different brand. And then when uh, he told me about opening our own brand, I was like, "Wow, that is gorgeous. That's awesome because this going to allow me uh, to create my own favorite design." So where did the name Himali come from? So Himali actually means uh, uh, people from the Himalaya, um, but it doesn't represent um, uh, only people. It represents the mountain. It represents the people of the mountains, and it represents the glaciers and it uh, you know the, the the traditions of Nepal and everything. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. So did you see? Did you and Dave see a um, an opportunity in the market that was not being filled? That you thought that Himali could fill that spot. Because you started off mainly with down jackets. Yes. And now you've expanded to, well, down suits and the monsoon hard shell pants and everything else. Yes, exactly. So, like, um, one of the things, well, there were a very limited uh, brand, uh, uh, like an a international brand of clothing in Nepal. Okay. Very, very limited. Right. And uh, I, I expected that if I could be uh, become a part of the Himali, then probably uh, we could, you know, uh, help more. With a with a more choice of clothing and more choice of like a, a different you know like um, Sherpa's favorite uh, design. Right, right. Uh, as a Sherpa and as a guide, I know what what are the people's expectations and what what they really prefer uh, to have gears like. And then uh, for me uh, also like um, uh, as we have very limited other gears in Nepal like Norfes and Mountain Harbor. Right. Um, All those doors across the street from Fire and Ice Pizza. Exactly. <laughs> so <laughs> people, you know, people who stop there is a perfect location. Yeah, it's a great such location, a good, good right there, place. entrance to Tumel. Yes, yeah. and uh, I, I have been, I've been their uh, great uh, customer for a long time, and I love their product a lot as well. And uh, so, um, actually, I got inspired from seeing like uh, you know their other uh, the, the other uh, brands and you know wearing their their product and everything. I got very inspired, and I was like, wow, there's uh, something we can learn, and pot- perhaps we can also uh, do something similar in the future. My uh, uh, role in the Himali at the Himali is mainly to test the uh, the, the brand like you're the doing with the, the suit here on Everest exactly so before we even like uh, uh, publish uh, in the market for people to buy we really make sure that it serves well so you're the guinea pig 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're the test market of one. I'm the, I'm the one of the persons to test. Uh, of course, like I, you know, even with the small things, we, we can feel warm enough. But really, I mean, uh, having a good uh, quality gear and, and bad quality gear makes a huge difference. Can you think of a, an example like on this down suit um, that, that from the prototype, the first one, maybe that was maybe three years ago to what it is today? Yes. Give us a couple of examples of how you changed that exactly. after wearing it on Everest um, yes. for the last so couple of years. So the first prototype was, um, was a great down, uh, down suit. I, which I wear on a Mount Manaslu, which is uh, one of the earth highs, uh, uh, is known as the earth highest mountain in the world. And uh, when I wear this uh, down suit on Manaslu, the Manaslu mountain gets pretty humid. You know, oh. we get a lot of snow and a lot of wet snow, uh, quite a lot of rain sometime. And so you need uh, a gear that is uh, good waterproof on this mountain. And uh, so I was wearing the first prototype of a Himali on Manaslu, and uh, and I, I could feel like some defect there. And then so I was able to uh, uh, share that with Dave, saying that, hey, Dave, I had this issue, that issue with this down suit. We should fix this. So then uh, he completely fixed that that uh, that part. And then later on, he sent me another one with the you know, revised uh, down yep, suit. Yep, yep. I did test with that. And I was like, OK, maybe the strap is too big. Maybe we got to make it a little bit lighter and smaller. You know, there are so many small details right, to, right. to, to uh, feed, give a feedback. And, um, and and that really uh, worked very well because Dev still keep working on that. And, uh, and at the same time, uh, our uh, very good and uh, respected friend, Ed Bister, uh, he was, he's also part of Himali now. And we're so, so honored to have him uh, with the Himali team. Yeah, Ed brings because just just decades of experience. Exactly. Of the, course, he's the only American to summit all fourteen of the eight thousand mountains. Exactly. He's the only American, much less the only yes. one that didn't use supplemental oxygen. So. That's true. He's and a legend. We, we were. I went. And I a heard, nice guy. And, and super <laughs> nice guy. And when I heard that Ed is going to become a part of our Himali, uh, I was super proud and so so honored. And so since um, uh, Ed is in a, uh, at the Himali, uh, you know, he also invests his time into right. looking into the gears and especially down suit. And when Ed has work on down suit, yeah. when he has checked the quality and, and everything, all the details of down suit, I felt so as a mountaineer and as a guide. I can feel so confident. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That uh, that that uh, the down suit is tested and and rechecked by uh, Ed. Well, I think it says a lot, though. That you know, Himali, d- d- designed by designed by Sherpas, made by Sherpas, tested by Sherpas. Yeah. You know, because you know, you guys are the gold standards when it comes yes. to especially in the in the Himalayas. So, what's talking about gear? Um, I mean, you. You've guided for years now, and you've summited Everest how many times? Uh, now 15 times. 15 times. Yes. And what about, uh, so you've done all the other, Choyo Yu, um, yes. Shishapangma, Manaslu, uh, Makalu. Yes, so I have, uh, beside uh, 15 Everest Summit, of course, this year is my 20th year uh, working on Mount Everest. 20th year. Uh, yeah. uh, I d- uh, but I summited only 15 times. And I did uh, this summit not for myself, but for my clients right, because I was right. working and leading my clients to the top of Everest. And uh, if I had gone there for a record, probably my number will be maybe a little bit higher now. Yeah, yeah. But I never wanted to set a record up there. So yeah. besides 15 Everest Summit, um, uh, I also was able to summit uh, Choyu uh, twice and Manaslu three times yep. and uh, also Mount Lhotse two times. And uh, and Hamad Dablam and many other mountains. So I want to come back to the gear, but but let me ask you real quickly: Is it still a special standing on the summit of Mount Everest for the fifteenth time as it was the first time? Yes, Alan. Like every single time when I stand there, I feel so special. Of course, uh, probably I felt very special myself when I first stood on the summit of Everest in two thousand and four, uh, and I was only twenty years at that time. And uh, poor Sherpa, to you be were able a baby. To, <laughs> Almost like a baby, yes. <laughs> but I was twenty quite, years old. Your first summit. That's great. Yeah, luckily, I love it. luckily, I was quite a strong baby. So <laughs> <laughs> you're a strong baby. <laughs> but you know, no for, crying. And no crying. Yes. And as uh, like for everybody, when you stand on the top of the world for the first time in your life, what a great feeling you have. Yes. You get there. Yes. You know? And after that. Um, 
I, I, you know, I got this special, you know, blessings of the mountain yes. to be able to go back to again and again uh, to climb this uh, mighty mountain. And um, every time uh, climbing with the clients and, you know, uh, uh, helping uh, my client to get to achieve his dream to reach the summit. So um, every time I feel special because I'm climbing with uh, different people. Yeah. And uh, all different people, is it is their first time to summit Everest. Right. Mm -hmm. And when I see they standing on the summit of the Everest for the first time, I can just imagine can feel that. How, how, how he or she will feel yeah, yeah. to be on the summit of Everest yeah. because I know that experience yeah. from my first summit of Everest. You know, you're, you, you were born in a sacred valley yes. and mountaintops, mountains are sacred. Exactly. Mountain tops are very sacred. In fact, I noticed that on this picture, you're not standing on the very, very tip top, yes. not the very pointy top. Exactly. Tell us why you don't stand on the top, the very tippy top of a yes. mountain. Yes. So like uh, the, the top of the peak, we just put like a plant, like a small uh, uh, bamboo stick or some stick, and we put like a scarf. There's a, a, a we call it kata. kata. So kata means uh, um, it, it represents kind of like a, a flower. You yeah. know, it's a, a auspicious uh, scarf yes. uh, with the eight lucky signs, and we offer this to the Mount Everest. And every time we get there, we we just uh, bend down and uh, we you know uh, we we respect to the mountain. Yes. And through our heart, we pray, and then uh, we pray for the whole world from you know standing on the summit of the world. You know, that's a good um, good way to transition to another topic I wanted to talk to you about, and that is about respecting the mountain. Um, you know, if you read the mainstream press today, all the way from the BBC to CNN, uh, often all you hear is about stepping over dead bodies and how much trash is left on the mountains. Exactly. It, without a doubt, there's, there are problems with mountaineering that I think we need to be honest about, um, especially like at the South Coal on, yes. on Everest and similar on the north side. Um, Timmy, why do you think that the guides are not embracing the leave no trace uh, ethics, such as using wag bags to remove solid human waste? I know some guides do, most guides don't. Yes. Um, I know you work with the company Climbing the Seven Summits, and I think Mike Hamill and, and you, you know, you have those type of ethics that you, that you put down. But why do you think that other companies don't do that? And with the respect that you've just talked about, of the mountains and it being a sacred place. Why do you think that they allow the trash to collect? Yes, Alan, really, it's uh, sometimes I feel it's uh, quite unfortunate that uh, not everybody, but uh, there are quite many climbers. They still seems like, uh, you know, they don't understand the importance of the environment. Uh, I know they're working hard every time. They're trying to do their best. And, uh, uh, but it's still, you know, uh, whether it's intentionally or unintentionally uh, you know they they leave a lot of lot of uh, 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 trash behind behind you know like on the mountain like such as south coal so first of all like um, why people leave a lot of trash at south coal is like one of the region is sometimes people bring so much stuff to the to the last camp and it's at 26,000 feet, 8,000 meters. Exactly. And, and it's very harsh. It's a very harsh weather and it's a very harsh place yes. to, to, to have so many things. But like people, they think that they will need a lot of gears and a lot of foods, a lot of fuels and, and, and all that. So they, they bring a lot, you know, pretending that they might, be, they might need more food. But w uh, when they get there and when you, they really uh, uh, use them, they don't use like not even a one third. So all the, 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 the rest, they become a trash. And sometimes also what happens is like, um, because it's 8,000 meter, it's really high, high, uh, high, highest camp yeah, yeah, yeah. in the world, I think. Yeah. And so after summiting Everest, they come back to this camp. And you're very tired. You are very tired and uh, you spend uh, pr probably uh, uh, one more night at this height. And the next day morning you come down and as you start to pack your gears, as you have so much gears to carry, sometime, uh, you know, they just say, okay, I'm gonna pack these gears and I will live here and I'll come and pick up tomorrow or a day after, after taking a few days of rest. So quite many people, they want to uh, come up 
to bring back uh, their stuffs it's not it's not uh, waste food or or empty you know like trash they're mainly like a tents and even a bottle of oxygens and uh, and uh, and some of their personal gears as well well i think the problem though is that if you leave let's say a tent on the south coal or yes. and most of the high camps because the winds are so ferocious that it rips the tents and shreds them exactly. and then you have the debris that gets frozen into the mountainside yes. and trying to take an ice axe and remove a piece of frozen nylon yes. out of the mountainside is virtually impossible exactly it's a really impossible like if they can't take the tent down at that time and if they leave it for like a day or two days It's they gone. just become uh, uh, like they will be buried under ice. I mean, not complete whole tents, but like almost the bottom of the tents. You can't take it off. Yeah. So, so you're so the best thing to do is not to leave it there in the first place. Exactly. So to take the, it back down. No matter how much tire you are, I think the best idea is to pack everything down, not leave the yeah. tents set up. Yeah. Uh, and 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 just take everything uh, out of the tents and pack the tents, put into the back, and uh, and maybe pack into a, like a big rice bag or a duffel bag yeah. and bring it down to camp two. Yeah. And, and you can't take helicopters up that high, so that's exactly, impossible, yes. especially in that case. What role do you think the government plays, and, and not only on Everest, but on other mountains around the world, from you know Elbrus in Russia to yes. Aconcagua in Argentina to Denali in Alaska, North America here? Yes. What role do you think the governments play in trying to protect these natural resources. Yeah, so well... Um, uh, you live in Switzerland for a, a number of years. Yeah. So you saw how the Swiss and the French and the Italians managed the Alps. Exactly. And uh, then also, like, I was on Aconcagua, and I know how they manage their trash yeah. there. I've been to Vinci, how strict the, the you know, yeah, the, for the garbage yes. was. So, so what role do you think the government plays? Exactly. Like, um, uh, since there was a lot of uh, trash on the mountain, Of course, everybody's uh, trying to bring their trash back down, but like you, you don't know who just leave the who just leave the trash there. You, we don't know who is that person's or company, and uh, and like when you go back there next year, you you get surprised and shocked to see a pile of uh, trash on the mountain. And um, but like since uh, three years now, that government of Nepal has started a, a, a cleaning campaign. And actually, this cleaning campaign uh, uh, has been a huge uh, help for the environment of the mountain. Good. And they're not cleaning only Everest, but also the rest of the other 8,000 meter peaks that are in Nepal. Especially the base camp. Uh, especially the base camp. Yes. And also, they go all the way to the last camp of the mountain. And I, I kind of, uh, as a guide, I kind of really appreciate that uh, step that government has taken. Because uh, otherwise, in the past, government just used to collect the, the you know, collect the permit fees and and they don't seem to properly use those money into the mountaineering. Uh, whereas uh, when I, you know, when I saw that government started uh, the cleaning campaign since three years, uh, I feel so, so happy. Of course, uh, you know, they can't clean the whole mountains in one or two seasons. So they may have to just continue yeah. working on cleaning the, the mountains, but the cleaning uh, is not just the, uh, uh, the solution. You know, I think government should, um, Uh, put a very strict rule over the companies and 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 guides and 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 sherpas and and, and clients. What role do you think that the individual client? Uh, one of the things I've noticed in after my first trip to Nepal was in 1997. Yeah, uh, it changed my life forever. The trek to Everest Base Camp, and um, and you know I've been following it now for however long that is now, 25 years something. Um, And it seems to me that the, there are people on the mountain today that are, have much less experience than maybe five, 10, especially 15, 20 years ago. Yes. Um, how, much, how much of a role do you think that the lack of experience plays into not understanding how sensitive, how fragile that mountain alpine environment is? Yes. Do you think that, that, that clients just think that, oh, well, I'm with a really strong Sherpa, they're going to pick up all my trash and, and take it away? Talk exactly. about the experience of yes. clients that you've seen and how it's changed over the years. Yeah, well, first of all, um, you know, there has been uh, more and more climbers uh, who seems to be attracted to the Mount, uh, Mount Everest, you know, climbing Mount Everest, which I understand sure. and I respect also. Yeah, yeah. But um, uh, one, <laughs> one of the thing, uh, one of the thing that makes me worry is like uh, every year there's more and more climbers, like increasing number of climbers uh, who wants to climb Everest. And many, many of them uh, seems to have no experience at all. 
I mean, not only Sims, but I personally uh, met a bunch of climbers uh, on the Kumbo Icefall and between the uh, Cam 1 and Cam 2 while we were passing through the Western Combs. You know, people complaining. And I saw all kinds of climbers there. The good climber, fit climber, uh, uh, but very, very weak climber and climber with no experiences. Uh, you know, sometime like in the Kumbo Icefall, uh, some client has, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're Crampons broken because you know they had to cross mm -hmm. over the ladders and uh, glaciers it and happens, all that, right. yep. and or sometimes the crampons uh, just got off their their boots, and they they were not properly tied, and they, they don't know how to put on the crampons. So they're not so very self-sufficient. Instead of putting crampons like the, the pick down, they were putting pick up and put their boot up. So they're putting they were, their crampons on the <laughs> upside down. Upside down, and. I thought maybe he had a like haze or something because normally people who has this oh it's problem, cerebral edema cerebral so he edema. was confused yes, exactly but, but then he I, just didn't know I asked him everything and he's like no 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 I I never wear this stuff in my life and I it made me so confused it it got off my feet and my boot and I don't know how to fix it I just can't get it and I'm like hey but the, you should put crampons uh, like down like in a in a proper way not upside down. <laughs> Because it's going to damage your boot. And they go like, yeah, but I have never put this in my life. You didn't climb other mountains? When I asked this question, they were like, yeah, I, man, I didn't have any time. So, so yeah. So, Tindy, <laughs> Tindy, you have your own company, Tag yes. Nepal in Kathmandu. And then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you also are the, the senior uh, lead guide with uh, Climbing the Seven Summits, Mike Hamill's outfit. Yes. Um, what? So, that particular client... You know, I would respectfully suggest that that person get more experience before going exactly. to Mount Everest. Yes. But what role do you think that the, the guides have in vetting and trying to figure out if their clients have the experience? Exactly. What role does a guide have in that? Yeah, so like personally, Alan, uh, uh, since I became a guide in 2011, I fully became uh, a guide. So uh, I guide clients uh, on the mountains. And uh, so before that, I used to work just as a climbing Sherpa. So that means basically I used to carry load and also help clients, you know, like guide uh, client uh, part time. And you're also now IFMGA yes. certified, which is a very rare club to be in. That exactly. means that, you, that you've taken, you've invested a lot in yourself. You've been certified to be a world class professional guide. Yeah. So I fully became a guide um, uh, in 2011. And that was a big deal uh, for my career. It is, it's mean a lot for my career, but yep. also it means a lot more uh, uh, profanil, uh, professionalism and um, and responsibility. So I had a more bigger responsibility after I became a guide, and then uh, and I had a lot more confident in me that I can uh, guide my clients safely on the mountain. Not only guide clients safely on the mountain, but also to keep mountain and mountain community safe. Uh, from all sort of, you know, uh, possible hazards or something. How, have you ever had to tell a client that you don't have the experience to go on a climb? Oh, yeah. And uh, Alan, <laughs> I, I, I tell you truth. In 2017, I had to reject 27 clients. Wow. 27. 27, 27 no. clients is a big deal. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. And I never get excited when client first reach out to me uh, asking for a climbing Everest uh, because I know uh, for some other people, maybe this could be a very uh, good news that they, you know, the client contact sure. them for Everest. Right. Is is a money, but for me, it's not about money. For me, it's about safety. So, when client reach out to me, I uh, I reply them and say, okay, uh, thanks for reaching me out. But uh, what's your experience on mountain? Have you what mountain have you climbed before? How many uh, like, what grade of mountaineering skill do you have? You know, I, I go through, you know, back and forth in the conversation before I fully uh, feel confident and I'm ready to take. And sometimes uh, uh, those clients, that, uh, those I accepted, uh, for example, in 2016, I even, as I didn't know the clients, but a client was, wa uh, was training on a mountain in Aconcagua and other mountains with another guide. And uh, so I actually personally asked the, the email address of guide that, that he trained okay. with. And then so I asked the guide, Okay, I'm climbing with this client. He reached out to me for Everest. What do you think? Do you think he's yeah. capable? And I trust the guide's uh, feedback because I know they will be very yeah. genuine. And then once he said, yeah, Tendi, he was perfect. He was so strong. He did very well during the training. He climbed that peak so well. I have confidence and, uh, and, I, uh, and I recommend you. Then I accept. 
So you so get a reference. Exactly. Yeah. So like um, uh, I know that some clients were really uh, upset when I say uh, no uh, for, for Everest in 2027. They still end up coming with another company. Yeah. I don't know if they submitted or not. I yeah. didn't didn't really follow up, but uh, uh, but I know they came with another company. But for me, this is something what I like to practice. So you might be saving lives when exactly. you do that. Exactly, because it makes a big difference. It's the safety of the clients, and if it's my safety and also my Sherpa's safety, you know, when you come to climb a big mountain like Everest or maybe K two, without a proper experience of mountains. You're gonna kill yourself. It's a, it, you know, it's it's very dangerous. So many people they might not have that idea. People heard about Mount Everest and they wanna they make a decision and they come to climb mountain. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's the company or the guide who should give an idea. If they don't have an idea, like for me, those clients who uh, uh, who I had to reject, I gave a list of uh, things to do. I said two years of practice. You practice for two years, you climb this mountain. If not this mountain, you climb at least that mountain. Yeah. Go on a mountain with a mountain guide. Learn all the skills that you need for Everest. So even the people that are experienced, what's the most common mistake that you see climbers make? on these, Whether it's you know, Choyo you or any, any of the mountains, even in, in the Alps. What, what are some common mistakes that you see climbers make? So one of the common mistakes I, uh, I see climber makes is like... Um, not uh, climbing in a good way there. Their style? There's like a... Their you know, technique? Exactly. There's a technique and like uh, people pushing uh, too hard uh, and uh, also people, um, you know, taking a big risks. Right, right. Sometimes people think like snowing, you know, even if there's a huge precipitation coming and, uh, and a strong wind coming, it seems like it doesn't mean anything for them. But uh, for me as a guide, as I've been practicing uh, uh, mountain for the last uh, 20 years, yeah. and I'm still learning to be better. But uh, uh, some people who come to climb mountain for the first time, they think like sometimes they, they know everything, and uh, <laughs> which I think is, uh, is very dangerous because sometimes this can kill you. And I call this uh, overconfident. Yeah, you know, I, uh, I attempted Everest three times before yes. I made it on my fourth time. And then I was lucky enough to, uh, to do Manislu and then K2. Yeah. Um, I've been very, very lucky. However, early in my career, um, I suffered what I call the greatest sin yes. that a climber can make. And that's the sin of arrogance. Right. That I overestimated how good I was and I underestimated how hard the mountain yes. was. And I see that often, with, with especially with uh, climbers that don't have a lot of experience because they read that, oh, you know, anybody can climb Everest and you know, there's a Starbucks on the top and an <laughs> escalator and all that, all those jokes. But there's still, yes. it, it, it helps people to have this false impression that yes. these high mountains are just easy walk-ups. And um, that's just simply not true, is it? Exactly. Yes. Uh, like for me personally, I learn a lot from the mountains. For me, mountain is a great teacher. Mm. It's a great school. And uh, uh, on the Everest, from the very, very beginning of my uh, career as a climbing Sherpa, I got to got the opportunity to work with the Western Guide and Western companies. And uh, so, for example, I work with the, uh, with the Willy Benegas, with the Mountain Madness, with the RMI Guides. And, uh, the Benigas uh, and with the Benigas brothers, They're famous, yes. and uh, and <laughs> and then uh, finally with uh, climbing the Seven Summit. Yeah. So I have got an opportunity to learn a lot, and which I really appreciate. And for me, and I, I think this is also a very unique tradition in Himalayas that since uh, um, Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norge Sherpa stood on the summit of Everest in 1953 and becoming the first person to stand on the top of the world. I think the tradition of climbing Western and Sherpa together has become a tradition. So that that became real traditional, a traditional, and and uh, I have a huge respect that as a as a new generation of Sherpa. Well, I know that I personally would never have made my summits without the help of uh, Kami yes. Sherpa out of Peng Boche. You know, Kami, I call Kami my guardian angel in <laughs> yes. the mountains. And I know you know Kami well. In fact, you'll be on Mount with good Kami yes. uh, coming up next month. So yes. Please, please tell him I said hello. I, I will definitely. <laughs> Thank you. And I, you know, I have been climbing for 20 years this year, and I always want to listen to the mountain. Mm. 
I think Mountain has so much to say, so much to tell you. If you listen. If you really listen with a wide ear. Yeah. You know? Uh, sometimes people don't listen alone, don't listen to the Mountain, and they get into trouble so badly. And when they don't listen to the Mountain, I think uh, it is a disrespect for the Mountain. It is disrespect for himself as well, putting him into a danger. You know, people often ask me, why do I climb or why did I climb? And I took a, it took me a long time to come up with a really good answer for that because, you know, there's a, you can always say, I, I enjoy the views, I enjoy the challenge and those type of things. But what I have come to understand is that when I go try to climb a mountain, a big mountain, an 8,000 meter mountain, and I, it, whether I make the summit or not really doesn't matter, but I come home a better version of myself absolutely because of what i've learned and the suffering you, all, you i don't care how good you are we all suffer exactly. on these big mountains oh yes <laughs> and so but by going through that it's a learning process and as you said if you if you open your ears and you're open to the to lessons that the mountains can teach us then we come home a better version of ourselves exactly. and hopefully then that allows us to to contribute to humanity that's in true. a better way. Exactly. That's why what I believe is uh, like the mount, the summit of a mountain is just a halfway. So, uh, you know, um, the real summit for me, I always tell to everybody that even to my clients, hey, the real summit is not the summit of the Mount Everest, okay? The real summit is when you get back safely down to base camp and get back to your family. That is the true summit of the mountains. Well, I believe that uh, your business partner, Ed Viesters, is very famous for the quote, and, I'll, and <laughs> this is the spirit of it, is that um, the summit is optional, but the return is mandatory. Mandatory. I <laughs> truly, truly uh, uh, agree with that. So as we wrap this up, what do you think um, some of the best advice that you can give Let, let's let's take that into into a couple of groups very young climbers let's say 18 years old you know they maybe they're here in colorado or up in, around mount rainier or maybe in switzerland and they have these dreams of climbing the world's biggest mountains what advice would you give that 20 year old the the mountain climbing is a is a big process follow i would say follow the process you know follow the be, process uh, po yeah. follow the process and uh be a good uh, good and kind mountaineer be a good and kind mountaineer take care of the mountain just yeah. look at the mountain and see how happy she is yeah. and just be like her you know <laughs> and it. how great it is you live a different world when you are on the mountain it changes your life it changes your direction it changes everything in your life and it's such a huge gift so practice the mountain in a good way and uh don't consider mountain as a football or toys. You know, it's very, for us Sherpa, the mountains are super sacred. We pray for this mountain and we regard mountain as a, uh, as a goddess deity, you know, female deity. And so pray for her and, uh, and protect the mountain and mountain will always protect you too. I can't think of a better way to end that uh, in this first, first podcast, uh, but you do make me think about the many pujas that I've attended where you have the altar and you put your, your sharps, you know, your ice axe and your crampons against the altar. And then you have the llama, you know, reading, praying out of a 300 year old Tibetan prayer book. And exactly. maybe there's other Sherpas, including someone like yourself who was a monk. And you hear that, that monotone chanting of the prayers and you see the juniper boughs and the smoke coming up. And it's against the backdrop of the mountains and you realize what a special gift it is and what a special exactly. opportunity and what a special responsibility it is for us to, to have mutual respect for the mountain. And during that puja, asking the mountain gods for uh, permission to climb the mountain, forgiveness for damaging it with our sharps, and then protection for everybody, for safety. That's very true. And I, I just, the pujas have always been just a special part of my, of my climbing life. Yes. Uh, now, like uh, some of the young people, they sometimes seem to skip that tradition. But for me, I strictly Never. Uh, force those uh, young people to, to try to follow our old tradition. Like for me, I'm a half from the older uh, generation of climbing Sherpa and a half from the new generation of Sherpa. And when I started climbing Everest back in 2003, uh, I think, um, you know, back in those days, I saw a lot of uh, climbers who used to w work on Everest since, you know, like 20 years. 
20 years uh, for them, but 20, you know, 20 years before I started Everest, which is a, you know, which is a big deal for me. It was yeah. so great honor to work with those old generation climbing climbers on Everest. Yeah. And so I always uh, learned something from them. And as, a, as I'm in the middle, I really wanted to deliver some good message to the young people. And that's why now I have also a book, a biography uh, written about, uh, uh, about me and, and, and about Sherpas and all that. So mainly uh, on that book, I try to uh, you know, deliver the good message to the younger generations and people that love mountains. Uh, you know, and to understand and to follow the ethics of mountains. One of the one of the things that, that we're doing here with this podcast is that we're in the uh, offices of Himali here in Boulder, Colorado, right above the flagship store. And uh, today, tonight, you're going to be having a book signing. And the name of your book is Higher Than Everest. Higher Than Everest, yeah, exactly. So, so the name Higher Than Everest means um, is the name of the book. And uh, it is both in uh, English and, and, and French, and hopefully there will be more uh, in uh, other languages as well. But yeah, higher than Everest means uh, it's uh, my ambition. I want to do something higher. Well, uh, you know, I climb Everest. I founded a Himali as a co-founder, and I have a company in Nepal called Tag Nepal. Uh, 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 and I work with, uh, as a guide with um, uh, Mike Hamill uh, from Climbing the Seven Summits. And beside all this, my personal business, uh, uh, Alan, I, one of my biggest dream is to look at back to my village and to my community. <clears throat> Since 2005, I have been very actively involved in supporting my community in back in my hometown. Since this is so remote area, uh, uh, I give a you know I give a first priority for the education, so that kids uh, you know the young kids doesn't have to become a porter at the same age as me at yeah. the age of 13. And I know how hard how tough the life is as a porter at the age of 13. So rather I wanted them to achieve something better, something more, and uh, and I wanted them to become more educated. That's why uh, I founded a, a, a charity like NGO uh, with the with the help of my friends uh, from Switzerland. And uh, so mm, we started supporting for, uh, for our children to, to be able to go to school. So first year we helped with the two, then we keep increasing more and more. And now we have uh, roughly about 65 uh, children who have uh, received uh, the support for their education. That's and, wonderful. And what makes me so proud is, Alan, that um, when I see some of those children uh, who have achieved like uh, their degrees and like you know high level school. Some of them have become a teacher for a school, and some of them have uh, become uh, become like um, a nurse. And who is serving back in my hometown? That's great. And beside that, um, uh, we also been able to uh, uh, make the life a little bit better, uh, better right. by uh, developing some infrastructure such as a bridge, like suspension bridge, because that was uh, one of the big part of thing that we were missing in our village. Because uh, as we are so far away from um, from the city, uh, none of the government attention gets to our uh -huh. uh, our village. So it was very very difficult to to share our problems to the government and all that. And finally, I was able to uh, uh, fund uh, you know through the through the donations. I was able to build two suspension bridge in my uh, home village, and that has been a huge relief for the local people to uh, go up and down safely. You know. Especially during monsoons, we get a very, yeah. very um, bad uh, rains, like heavy rains, and sometimes you get a very big river, super dangerous. And uh, that's why, um, so we've been uh, building two, uh, we have built two bridges and built trails, and we're still working on building a trails. And we have recently been also, uh, actually it's not recent, it's been five years that we have started working on, on a permaculture uh, concept, which is a concept for um, for uh, planting food, like okay. vegetables. Mm. So, and to make the people in the village more independent, and also the idea is that our village is so quiet and is so holy, so sacred for the for the Buddhism, 
And um, so sometimes I see the younger generation leaving the village. Yeah. So only old people live in the village and young people go to uh, go to city, uh, which I understand because they want to uh, want to explore and they want to uh, look for uh, opportunities. That's very good. But sometimes when they come with the whole family, thinking that city is the best option and, and once they get in city, they, they get everything, that's very wrong. So that's why I'm trying to develop my village to attract those young people to remain in the village. They don't have to spend 12 months a year in the village. They can go out of village, maybe make some money from the mountain or from working in the office or whatever, and go back to the village. Because now the road has reached a little bit high up, not until our village, but um, the, the, because of the access, everything, the distance has been much mm -hmm. shortened. So I hope uh, I will be able to continue supporting my village and uh, and hope our uh, hope I will see the village live and I life. and I assume that uh, you don't uh, <clears throat> that you don't want your ten year old and your two and a half year old daughters to become mountain guides. Yes, I think uh, definitely <laughs> not. I'm uh, dreaming something uh, better for them. Yeah, of course. Um, uh, as a parents, you know, you will be so worried when you are gone to the mountain. Yes. Like my mom, she has never been on a mountain. And uh, she always asks me, hey, Tandy, don't go to mountain. I feel it's too dangerous. Yeah. And I tell her, I, I always tell her. Now she kind of don't believe her. In the, at the beginning, I told her, hey, mom, don't worry. Mountain is just flat. <laughs> <laughs> on the top. <laughs> on the top. <laughs> so she's not sure if I'm right, but uh, if I'm being uh, honest. But like, uh, you know, just to make her feel... Uh, easy and better and, yeah. and uh, ma just to make her sleep well during the night <laughs> I always tell her you know that kind of joke so well <laughs> Tindy Sherpa you're you're a good son you're a good husband good father and a world-class mountaineer and now a world-class businessman so thank you for being here on this first podcast for Amali Alan thank you so much I have been uh, a friend with you since uh, at least like a Eight, almost 10 years ten now years, yeah, yeah. that uh, I first met and then um, I really appreciate your contribution towards the climbing community in Himalaya. I mean uh, today there is no other block than yours where we can go and uh, say okay what's happening uh, on the mountain. We can just go okay we can type Alan Arnett blog <laughs> and we can get all the information there. Yeah. Because, it's a labor of love. Because uh, if not, like there are many different team and many different team gives a different news. And whereas when we can follow one platform of the news of the mountain, uh, I think this is a huge uh, contribution for the mountains. And I truly appreciate uh, Alan. Thank well, you very much. You're very kind. <laughs> Thank you. And, and Thank namaste. You. Namaste.